Dear participants, hello, my name is Ilse Rose and I'm RGSL professor and the holder of Jean Monnet chair. Today, I will deliver a lecture in the framework of this project, which is devoted to EU external relations. We will speak more about United Nations, United Nations system, courts, but also the way how EU is acting with and within international organizations. We will start though by discussing relationship by the European Union with third countries. So what kind of relationship can we see from quite loose relationship like just partnerships or agreements but also further relating to integration in the EU. So let's get started. The plan of the lecture is for the first to discuss partnerships and interaction between the EU and the third countries. Then we will pass over to different level of engagement with agreements and integration into the EU for some countries that are reaching further and more ambitious in their partnership with the EU. To start with, I would propose to use this slide as a task and your own assessment of different kind of formations according to level of integration. So for that, some of them, like partnership, the relationship between the third country and the EU is quite distant. It is rather political than economical or not at all integration level. Then if we see further agreements, trade agreements or association agreements, then we can already speak about the targeted and very concrete engagement by the third country with the EU. And legal instrument in framing with the engagement would be either free trade agreement or association agree agreement. So nowadays, these agreements have become more comprehensive. Um, that means that they no longer include only trade issues, but can also deal with issues relating to investments, relating to rule of law, uh, uh, relating to some kind of uh, conditionality measures that are inbuilt in these uh, agreements. And it also means that once such deep and comprehensive agreement is uh, ratified, both the European Parliament will be engaged, but also national parliaments. And this is then related to the competences. So the European Parliament may ratify the agreement that is set between the countries uh, and would foresee rather exclusive competence of the union. And then also on the level of supranational institutions, it can be ratified. Whereas once the uh, agreement includes provisions that are not of the exclusive competence, but rather coordinated or supported competence, then these agreements are passed through national parliaments. And uh, the question here may always be 
would we then refrain from such mixed agreements in order to, you know, just to let them pass easier with one vote, consent vote in the European Parliament? But this then would contradict also the objective because uh, the more comprehensive agreement is, uh, the deeper and, and more qualitative um, and foreseeable relationship it entails for uh, the respective country with the European Union. So I would not argue that the EU should switch to EU-only agreements to make things easier work. Well, let's now get an insight into further different types of relationships. Customs union. So customs union is the interaction between uh, uh, respective country and and the EU within movement of goods. And customs union definitely is also part of the EU itself because the internal market by itself already foresee that there are custom free movement internally in the EU. But one of the uh, Typical examples where in customs union is used and even now currently there is ongoing work to upgrade uh, the engagement and level of engagement is between the EU and Turkey. So uh, not all the fields under customs union are agreed. So EU is now also encouraging uh, customs union to spread further to um, fields like agricultural products. So customs union would then be seen as a step in direction on working closer with the EU, but quite specifically on the movement of goods. Now, when we come to EFTA and EEA, so here the engagement of the countries that are part of EFTA, European Free Trade Agreement, is set in uh, the EFTA uh, group of countries and uh, these countries specifically um, also focus on free trade issues but not necessarily are willing to further integrate into the EU and here one of the examples is Switzerland so the um, EFTA uh, countries are the issues de dealt with under EFTA framework are also um, passed through the working group in the EU um, for experts dealing with EFTA, EFTA issues. So this means that um, even here, the relationship is very much conducted under the framework um, of this formation and the same principles are applied to all EFTA members. European Economic Area, EEA, is a framework that is possibly closest to the um, further integration into the community and European Union, but European economic area countries are mainly um, engaging in uh, relationship with uh, internal market issues. 
so within the formation countries belonging to a European economic area are also in compliance on EU law that relates to harmonization of internal market rules. And including also free movement um, of persons, free movement of goods, uh, capital and services. And uh, these four freedoms under EEA mean also that when uh, Great Britain decided to leave the EU and uh, to opt for next relationship with the Union, one of options should have been to engage with the EEA, European Economic Area, but it never was enough interesting for uh, Great Britain for that reason that the uh, four freedoms then would also mean um, labor force mobility uh, to the UK, which was among issues that were behind triggering also um, withdrawal referendum. So uh, further, European community and European Union, of course, are the, the highest level of integration. So it's union itself. So countries inside community, inside union, cooperate under the uh, objectives of the treaties. And most, I would say, deepest integration level is countries who are part of European Union and have opted for monetary union, EMU, um, economic monetary union. And with Schengen area, we, we have a bit different story. Schengen uh, rules are not directly part of Lisbon Treaty. Rather, uh, Schengen agreement is um, additional intergovernmental agreement between countries. And uh, here we are having actually countries that are not EU members like Iceland or like Switzerland. If we would then rank the sequence so starting from engagement with the EU on the lowest level and go going then further to the deepest level, then I would put partnerships as first, then with free trade agreement followed, association agreement, EFTA, customs union, European economic area, and then followed by European community, that is pillar first of the Aki Communitaire, and then, of course, union itself. And the, the deepest integration in the EU would be then through economic monetary union. And Schengen is, an, as said, a, additionally, agreement outside the, um, the sequence of integration um, that has been discussed here. In other words, we can also put it um, as uh, here illustrated that uh, the, the frameworks within which countries can cooperate, um, uh, economic area countries, uh, European Union countries, Eurozone being in the core of integration, and customs union being possibly most inclusive because here we also have countries that are not uh, part of, of, of union, but cooperate with unions through customs, um, customs union. And then we have uh, 
these EFTA countries, uh, four countries uh, that are um, engaging in uh, European free trade agreement. But when we speak about engagement um, of the European Union with the third countries, uh, we need to assess that the interaction is possible on bilateral level, so meaning that EU as a single personality, as a single in, in international subject with the respective third country. But it is also possible that EU engages in multilateral organization. So how this um, work is done and how the EU is, is in implementing the mandate that is given to its external representation within the treaties. So we will here address issues of EU's global influence. And to start with, I want to attract your attention to possibly one of the shortest articles under Lisbon Treaty, Article 47. And Article 47 explains that the EU shall have legal personality. So what does it mean? that the EU shall have legal personality. And if it is a new article, how then was the global actorness by the EU before Lisbon was adopted? So I would start by explaining that before 2009, when the Lisbon Treaty entered into force, um, the EU was represented externally either by the um, rotating presidency or by the commission. So in the third countries, we had EU Commission representations, offices by the European Commission. So the external representation was by one institution, EU Commission. But when dealing with foreign policy or partnerships or more political issues, then the Council presidency, either it was head of state, the prime minister from the council presidency, or the foreign minister holding of the country holding EU presidency. So which means that before Lisbon Treaty entered into force, the country during six months holding presidency had much more external outreach. In 2009, it changed, and EU was no longer represented through or via the council presidency, foreign minister. Suddenly, in the United Nations, because of Article 47, we faced a challenge. Well, if we see what happened before 2009, so the Lisbon Treaty uh, was adopted during Swedish presidency by the end of Swedish presidency, and we had Swedish foreign minister and Swedish uh, prime minister actually representing EU in the United Nations. So EU was at the table. After 2009, because no longer one 
institution or body would represent EU, but EU as a whole. It changed also the seating at the table at the United Nations. So in order to deal with this, um, in 2011, the EU was granted an enhanced observer status. And it allowed EU, as from 2011, to speak in debates um, along with um, other groups uh, and also to engage with United Nations, just to have right to reply or rise point of order or circulate docu documents. So then it was no longer presidency country, but EU as seen under Article 47 as a single personality, but under enhanced observer status. So this was possibly one of the first commitments by, at that time, High Representative Lady Ashton, actually to get this through and to get this done, not to lose the influence by the EU at the United Nations. Um, yet, enhanced observer status is not as uh, strong as um, it was before. The EU has no uh, voting rights um, and it has no rights to act in the Security Council, but it can cooperate and closely um, through um, the enhanced observer status uh, chapeau um, still um, put forward resolutions, uh, speak in debates and, and uh, interact and um, uh, position itself. The Article 47 had also other consequences. So if we would say that um, in United Nations, possibly the status of presidency that expressed the EU as one voice was stronger compared now later to enhanced observer status. Um, but here I would also claim that uh, with time, EU has definitely raised its voice and put itself very visible in United Nations, even under this uh, uh, legal construction that is offered by Article 47. But in other cases, the power of U European Union has increased and prominently when in concluding international agreements. Um, and here, uh, the EU speaking with one voice as through this single uh, personality um, has also reached uh, much more qualitative and quantitative engagement with third countries in terms of um, agreeing on international agreements with third countries or with uh, blocks of the third countries. And the Article 47 also allowed European Union to become a member in international organizations. Um, not the Commission, not the Presidency, not the Parliament, but EU as a single personality. So it has definitely helped the EU to be present also in legal terms to be part of uh, as one body in international organizations. And finally, the third implication I want to point out here is that 
Article 47 allowed Europe to European Union to join international conventions. And by joining international conventions, uh, this can be seen like European Convention on Human Rights uh, was foreseen that EU will join it. It's still ongoing process, but at least the Article 47 opens the legal scope of this process. When let's use some some time to discuss international agreements. So legally, if we know now that EU is acting as a single personality under Article 47, so EU is as a part party in international agreement, then it also can now um, pass an international uh, agreement that constitutes a legal act uh, of the European Union. And while concluding this act, EU is acting as a legal whole, as a legal entity. And it also has changed uh, interaction power, how both the Council, the, co the, the Commission and the European Parliament interact in this process. So Council is agreeing on the main mandate that is passed for the European Commission to um, present it and on behalf of the EU to negotiate with the third country and once this is done, then the European Parliament is engaging in ratifying and European Parliament has a veto power here, meaning that by consent procedure, once European Parliament adopts or agrees um, on the uh, agreement, the Parliament is not allowed to amend it, but the Parliament can reject it. So Parliament has rights to veto to veto the agreement um, in case they would uh, not agree with its contents. So the Treaty of Lisbon has increased the role both of the Commission and of the European Parliament when passing international agreements. And 2009, a Lisbon Treaty was um, um, entered into force. And actually, half a year later, in summer 2010, for the first time, uh, the Parliament rejected agreement that was uh, passed through the Council and agreed with the Commission. But Parliament, in order to protect, actually, the uh, data protection and uh, individual integrity of European citizens uh, blocked uh, the uh, processing of the agreement between um, uh, EU and United States. Uh, so after this uh, event and after this experience, so actually the EU realized uh, uh, the real powers of European Parliament under Lisbon Treaty once uh, passing agreements. And uh, with time, European Parliament has been much engaged already in a process so not to surprise the legislators at the end when European Parliament is in disagreement, but European Parliament is informed about the, uh, the steps in negotiating agreement already uh, during the process. And um, here, some words about Commissioner of tr for Trade. Uh, because of global actorness, so that the international agreements become part of instruments for the European Union 
to interact with global partners. Um, so the trade has become an important part of external relations. And uh, as such, it's also very complex. So as explained in the beginning of this lecture, we are moving to more comprehensive mixed agreements that conclude, once concluded, um, they contain much more than trade, uh, pure trade only. What else has changed after Article 47 on single personality is in place? We are speaking about not adopted a constitution, but rather speaking about the Treaty of Lisbon has amended uh, the um, two treaties, uh, the Treaty of the Functioning of European Union and Treaty of European Union. Um, so this also means that um, the constitution and failure of uh, adoption of European constitution showed that there are limitations by citizens in European Union to agree on deepening or even federal thoughts uh, in Europe. So um, EU has gained more um, powers, external powers after Lisbon Treaty was adopted, but through means that are never called federalistic. So we don't have a European foreign minister. Uh, we are having high representative vice president of security um, and foreign policy. So the way how the EU's power externally has increased um, is done in a way um, that is embedded in a treaty uh, in a very pragmatic way. Some more uh, practical implications that actually community didn't more um, anymore uh, exist in a way we at that time before 2009 put commission in, in front seat. Uh, so it is EU that is now in front seat as such, as a single personality. So EU, uh, EU delegations in the third country instead of the commission delegations or uh, the court of justice of the EU. And it is in the slide um, here, it's also seen that the change uh, that happened legally with the implementation of uh, Lisbon Treaty uh, meant that these two amended treaties, Treaty of Functioning of European and Treaty of European Union, um, put an end to the three pillar structure that was in a previous treaty, Treaty of Nice. Um, and with um, 1993, uh, when Maastricht Treaty was adopted, then uh, the three pillar system um, came into, how to say, in being. And uh, that meant that the community matters would be considered as uh, pillar one, and foreign security policy pillar two, and then justice and home affairs as pillar three, uh, two latter being intergovernmental and community method being supranational. Uh, here, abolishing three-pillar system uh, with one single EU personality and actually focusing on union method and CFSP. Conclusion is that actually justice and home affairs have become more supranational with adopting of the Lisbon Treaty. This slide explains a challenge 
with external representation. The um, situation here is as follows. The um, European Commission President, Ursula von Leyen, and the European Council President, Charles Michel, are paying visit to Turkey and meeting Turkish President and Turkish Foreign Minister. This picture gained even a name of soft gate because of issues of seating. And I would not here on emphasize the seating in terms of protocol or gender, but rather bring you to a discussion about power of representation. Who has, to what extent, first-hand in external representation in the EU? And here we can, again, recall well-known saying that Kissinger wanted to call the EU and ask, tell me, whom should I call? Give me a phone number. And my answer here would be, Definitely, the seating arrangement would depend on the subject that was discussed. If the subject discussed is um, human rights and uh, political cooperation uh, with um, between the Union and Turkey, then the seating arrangement with European Council President and the Turkish president, third country, would, would be quite accurate. And since EU under Article 47 has single personality, it's not uh, one of these who are paying more like important role, but rather what competence EU has in discussing matters with the third country. If the competence is enlargement, then it's the commission president that has first hand. If the competence is also trade, then again, the European commission president comes first. So depending on the issue, the External representation is shared, I would say, between four actors. One, European Council Presidency. Two, European Commission President. Three, High Representative Vice President of the Commission. And four, the Rotating Presidency. But Rotating Presidency will be after 2009 and with the legal personality on article 47 shadowed so they can engage with institutions but in issues mentioned they would not play the first role and be in front line but again this depends on um, issue at hand and to some extent also on personalities. We have discussed this. So situations that I offered to you, the commission speaks with the United States president. The commission speaks with France during French presidency. High representative vice president also has powers that are um, engaged uh, with uh, respect of representing union in CFSP, CSDP matters and external relations. And uh, European Council president would present Europe when um, addressing political issues and more intergovernmental. And finally, um, here we see even uh, Swedish king meeting uh, the president of the commission together with the uh, presidency prime minister during Swedish presidency 2023. 
So as said, many chefs in kitchen, but there is always quite clear logics. What are they talking about would determine who is representing. So here I leave for your information also the slide uh, from the treaty explaining the mandate of the Commission of the European Council President. And uh, I think Article 15 puts it in again in a in an interesting legal language that the European Council presidency has role of external representation, but his role is limited to um, not to intervene in powers of the high representative of Union um, Foreign Affairs and Security Policy. To make it easier to understand, I would apply this uh, graph as solution in uh, logics of external representation. So once EU is represented externally, and it relates either to bilateral cooperation with one third country or in multilateral cooperation, then one issue at hand is relating foreign policy, security policy, or defense policy. It would mainly be high representative, um, supported by the Council of the EU, but also by European External Action Service. But if it is an issue that relates to development uh, aid, to humanitarian aid, neighborhood policy, trade, or environment, then this most likely will be either the commissioner of this particular field or the commission president uh, in external representation function. But here, to agree on position by the, by the European Union as a single personality, then interaction between three uh, bodies and institutions are necessary. So commission, will interact with council and the um, decision is also coordinated and implemented through European External Action Service, EEAS. As promised, I would like now to spend part of my lecture to explain United Nations system, and then I will conclude by explaining how the European Union is engaging in the United, Na the United Nations system. It all started after First World War and Paris Conference, where United States president called upon action to agree on peace and to agree on peaceful settlements through multilateral cooperation. And the Allies, um, after First World War, United Kingdom, France, Italy, Japan, and also others agreed in 1935 to establish League of Nations. Like United States, although it was an idea came from the United States president, but United States never joined. And USSR was part of League of Nations, but was expelled after USSR invaded Finland. Yet, the first multilateral attempt of League of Nations was not successful. And much of criticism has been pointed to the inability to realistically assess political and um, 
foreign policy situation at that time. So United, the predecessor of United Nations, so League of Nations could not actually prevent uh, conflicts and wars and countries started to withdraw one by one. To overcome this, the next multilateral organization should have more division of labor and division of responsibility. We have still, we are witnessing the first seat of League of Nations in uh, Switzerland, in Geneva. So the building is still there. And interesting fact that at that time, Latvia being an independent state also was part of League of Nations. And Latvian government in 1938 donated a nice room that was reflecting also typical Latvian architecture at that time. This room was renovated in 1993 and is still in League of Nations, now United Nations Human Rights Council building in Geneva. So after Second World War, the negotiations started about building a multilateral organization that would be based on a charter. And the charter on United Nations became the legal basis for the establishment of United Nations International Organization in 1945. And uh, the main, to avoid the uh, mistakes or weaknesses by League of Nations, United Nations created five main organs. And uh, some of them were inherited from League of Nations, other were established anew. And the main objective definitely was to to follow the international rule-based order to main, maintain international peace and to develop friendly relations among the nations in achieving cooperation and jointly solving economic, social and humanitarian problems. So currently 193 states are in United Nations International Organization and also international Court of Justice is an integrated part of the Charter of United Nations. With a lot of global challenges, many questions arise, is United Nations as international organization efficient? In particular, this question is asked also in Latvia with respect to Latvia candidating for United Nations Security Council seat in 2025 elections for the term 2026-2027. This United Nations organization is actually the only organization that can deal with the charter, the principles that are tried in the United Nations Charter, that all member states have sovereign equality, that all member states 
comply with the United Nations Charter, that countries must settle their disputes in peaceful way and avoid using force. But United Nations such is not intervening and interfering in domestic affairs, but is acting as solving from the collective, in a collective way with uh, under the charter and international law. So for small countries, the United Nations give the framework of legal certainty. And uh, with the, its structure is in 193 member states of United Nations, the headquarter is in uh, New York and United Nations Human Rights Council has its headquarters in Geneva. Another headquarter for agencies of United Nations is also located in Vienna. So here I listed some of the agencies that work under the United Nations system, like Food and Agriculture Organization, International Labor Organization, International Monetary Fund, UNESCO with the office in Paris, UNICEF, World Bank, and World Health Organization. So they are spread all over the world, some in Europe, some in the United States. And uh, each of them has in the United Nations system follow the same logics of election, but also logics of regional groups. And the regional groups, um, as from the outset uh, in the United Nations, uh, five uh, regional groups are following geographical uh, logics, geographical representation, and Western uh, countries, Western European states um, are all in group BIOG. Then we have group of African states, group of Asia Pacific states, GRULAC, group of Latin America and Caribbean countries, and group of Eastern European states, EEG. And whenever there is a new vacancy at either on the high positions of these organizations or any other issue of, of elections, then these elections are held within the regional group logic. So each group has um, either nominates or in case of, for example, United um, Nations Security Council is assigned um, a number of seats for every election um, term. As an example, for example, in uh, Western European group, VEOG, for Security Council, there are always two seats whereas for Eastern European group, there is one seat. So if more than one country is candidating for election in um, within the EEG um, group, then there is not a so-called clean slate, but then there is a competition. It was already discussed that the fact why EU is so important currently is that we don't have other institution, international organization on um, global level, which includes 193 countries and aim to stabilize international peace and security, to promote human rights, to foster social and economic development. 
uh, to provide humanitarian aid um, in cases of conflicts and natural disaster or to solve um, socioeconomic issues. So how is the United Nations doing this? So uh, through two organs, mainly through resolutions, adopting resolutions, General Assembly um, and uh, Assembly is um, consisting of all the members of the United Nations uh, with the uh, General Assembly uh, President um, in um, acronym called PGA. And uh, the um, General Assembly is both electing judges, very important. So the Euro uh, International Court of ju uh, Judges or members of, of um, other uh, institutions is elected by the General Assembly, but also um, electing um, United Nations Security Council um, countries. And this is something that uh, Latvia is very much facing and looking forward to collect two thirds of all the member states in United Nations in 1993 uh, to pass these two thirds of uh, votes um, and gain um, the uh, status of a Security Council member uh, for the term 26-27. And it's not a written rule, but in many cases, the Uni European Union um, countries um, are coordinating uh, their um, votes and uh, trying to support also European Union countries in important elections. But as said, there are also national interests and um, since this is um, the vote uh, that is uh, is not open um, then um, there's also until the last moment of the elections a lot of uncertainties around the voting patterns general assembly held session. So sessions start in the second week uh, in September and, and continue uh, with high level week at the end of September when the heads of states um, deliver speeches um, that are always uh, portraying and reflecting the foreign policy status quo uh, of uh, global community, but also of uh, the positions that the member states take. Um, and in the gen General Assembly, speaking about European Union, European Union is always presenting, presented and delivering speech and also coordinating the ministers who arrive, foreign ministers and heads of states in coordinating action during high level week. General Assembly can also uh, call for emergency sessions when the resolutions are passed. And this is how the res resolution by General Assembly looks. So um, it has a preamble, it has a, um, a, a name and um, a resolution also may be put forward uh, by um, members of uh, the United Nations and co-sponsored by, um, by other countries. So another um, high level format of decision making with United Nations Security Council, with United Nations is the Security Council. It is the most powerful security uh, council is the most powerful decision making body. And um, it has five permanent members. And it is the consequence also of decision that must was made after the end of the Second World War. Uh, so this um, 
number of countries and uh, adding additional countries is very much discussed under the um, issues that relate to United Nations reform. Uh, but it never comes to changes because any changes that could be made have to be made with um, uh, consensus of also uh, uh, current uh, permanent members. So veto rights are there. And to um, in contrast to uh, resolutions adopted by Security Council, these uh, resolutions are um, compulsory resolutions. So they are um, they are mandatory, and uh, this is also the reason why um, the um, vote is sometimes put against its adoption. So power of veto um, of any of the countries uh, is something that is very much discussed because um, currently the countries that are violating uh, brutally violating international law are also vetoing resolutions that condemn this action. Well, once this lecture is about European Union, but in order to understand the European Union interaction with the United Nations system, it is also important to understand all the levels where the European Union is engaged. It's not only putting forward a resolution uh, or deciding on resolution within uh, the framework of 193, but also engaging with the committees. And there are six committees. And uh, within the committees, European Union is actively working. And uh, this, there is a, a term called burden sharing. And burden sharing means that the um, countries can um, take an important leadership role in carrying out work in any of these committees. Um, so the countries who are more engaged or have resources or just uh, for reasons of solidarity always are taking burden sharing within uh, among the co member states. As explained already, um, resolutions are formal and um, they um, are proposed and drafted by a state, and then they can be uh, further supported uh, by joining in countries, so-called co-sponsors. And uh, for adoption of United Nations Security Council resolutions, um, at least nine members have to vote positively, and uh, those who are having veto power um, have to be in consensus. So this means that uh, the Security Council has five members of uh, permanent members and then ten members who are voted for, um, elected for uh, two years uh, period. ECOSOC is an important format uh, because of uh, European, sorry, because of United Nations being more and more engaged in issues relating to environment, uh, to climate, to sustainability, to digital issues, um, so with um, more close to people and close to societies topics. The um, institution was established in 1945 and uh, is also um, elected for three years period. And Latvia had been elected and um, just closed its uh, period 
its elected, elected period in 2022. As elected member, um, there is an engagement in uh, the ECOSOC uh, sessions that are held in, uh, in, in July. And uh, ECOSOC is also engaging in financial issues. Um, and also um, there are committees with engagement of um, World Bank and International Monetary Fund. And this is a format where the civil society is also giving input. So NGOs, um, including on issues on, on gender, um, on inclusiveness, um, uh, on um, different kind of uh, capacity building and, and good governance. As all international organizations, uh, the United Nations has a secretariat um, and uh, the secretariat is quite large with uh, the, the staff of the United Nations is larger than the permanent staff of the whole European Union. But it has to be noted that Europe, United Nations work around the world. It's not only New York or uh, Vienna, uh, but uh, we have United Nations bodies all around the world. Uh, with the administrative functions and implementing decisions and um, reaching out uh, within the objectives of United Nations. So the um, returning back to United to the European Union, how is EU interacting? So we have all EU member states at the same time are also member states of United Nations. But here the treaty defines, the treaty uh, of the EU defines how EU will interact with international organizations. So EU as a legal single personal personality, not member state, but EU as such. And uh, this is also defined uh, in um, with regard to competencies. So when we are dealing with trade, we have exclusive competence, or when we are dealing with environment, we have shared competence. So first of all, um, the engagement will be defined, uh, so coordinated action, but within the set powers of the union in exclusive, shared, or co coordinated competence. And then there are some thematic articles. So articles that set out, for example, environment, or set out economic cooperation, or set out humanitarian aid. So under these articles, again, the role of the EU as a single personality will be defined. And I would like to emphasize Article 34 of Treaty of European Union that actually is already outlining the role of coordination so that not that individual member states are setting forward their national interests, but that EU shall coordinate actions in international organizations for the purpose that EU then can speak one voice. And it is done uh, both the speaking and presenting the agreed position by the European Union is through the high rep representative, but also through the um, individual member states who at that time are elected as Security Council members. 
And it is also said that the permanent members of the Security Council should also defend the positions and interests of the Union. So those countries who are per being European countries and permanent members of the Security Council. In fact, it is showing the direction in reality, um, Definitely, the Security Council members are acting on behalf of their state positions. And I rather would say that the European Union dimension comes in here through the EU coordination mechanisms. So also through the presidency, through the EU delegation and including by also the countries from the EU that are elected as non-permanent members of the United Nations Security Council. So therefore, for European interests, for preserving European interests, it is so important that um, for two years term, in Security Council non-permanent seats, there are some or one at least country from the EU. This was the case in um, 2021 that in United Nations Security Council actually four countries from European Union were elected at the same time. So in Western European group and in Eastern European group. And uh, we, we had uh, quite a good representation um, that also was overlapping from, from year to year so that the EU voice could be well uh, formulated and, um, and heard. Does the EU speak with one voice? Well, we saw that the treaty is defining the vision of EU being united. In order the, for this to happen, the coordination is, is ongoing in international organizations. And this is carried out through the EU delegations in countries where the uh, international organizations have their seat. For example, EU coordination in Vienna, or EU coordination in New York, or even less informal, but still EU coordination in The Hague and EU coordination in Paris. So in uh, under all international organizations, the EU delegation or the presidency in charge I would say in The Hague, rather the presidency than the EU delegation, takes the lead in uh, coordinating the position and trying to reach a unified and consolidated voice um, in uh, presenting the EU. On sensitive issues, sometimes member states fail to agree and they may have diverging uh, positions. But in general, EU is um, um, indeed the, the strength of EU global power also depends on its capability to speak with one voice and to present joint statements on behalf of the EU. And this is huge work that is done 
by the EU delegations in uh, the countries where the um, international organizations have their offices and by all the EU member states diplomats who are taking part in this and uh, um, acting with purpose to make European speak European Union speak with one voice. But another strength that EU has and that needs to be more communicated is the increasing funding by the EU in the United System. So there can be two ways of funding, one through the individual member state contributions or voluntary contributions, and the other as EU as a single personality contributing to the United Nations system. And here uh, we are speaking about the agency that were uh, presented in one of these slides in World Health Organization or UNDP program or UNICEF program. Um, and, and so these funds would go uh, for the objectives that are of uh, the uh, charter objectives of the United Nations, but distributed to the geographical regions or across thematic um, um, lines. And a large proportion of member states funding, 23% goes for United Nations peacekeeping budget. So therefore, um, Actually, the um, EU is a global leading donor, and uh, this can be seen also in this graph that with time every year, uh, the uh, funding is increasing. Um, a bit change that after COVID happened, but then again recovering in 2022. Some words about United uh, Nations, um, uh, other important branch, which is Human Rights Council. And Human Rights Council located in uh, Geneva, uh, it was created quite late, 2006 only, and it can be considered as intergovernmental body with United Nations system. So the Human Rights Council, without, it would des deserve a, a separate lecture, the same as United Nations. But as this lecture is about uh, European Union power and European Union voice, then I would limit myself just explaining that the um, logics of working in Human Rights Council is across advisory uh, committees and uh, that there is a cycle of, um, um, of, of human rights record monitoring um, that actually each country is undergoing uh, such kind of scrutiny of, of, of um, implementation of human rights principles. And this is all coordinated in a, uh, in a system that uh, kind of very predictably sets every, um, un, every country um, under the screening. In, before coming to international courts, I would uh, like to point out that in um, work of Human Rights Council in Geneva, uh, the European Union coordination is, is very strong uh, through the EU delegation. It is interacting with the EU uh, delegation in New York and interacting with uh, the um, bodies in Brussels, so that 
whatever union does in Geneva is also linked to the EU activities in New York, but uh, going via the capital so that everyone is uh, connected. And EU is also passing um, position papers, uh, passing opinions, passing uh, joint positions, and um, um, including EU member states in coordination activities in Geneva. Some words about the courts. And here we have a different situation because international courts, and I touch upon just few of them. Here we have a picture from The Hague, the Court of um, uh, International Court of Justice. And uh, the Court of Justice is uh, very much part of uh, the uh, United Nations system uh, that established as a, a pillar as starting from Law C, but further uh, emerged in uh, 1996 as a part of uh, United Nations Garter, Garden, uh, Garden of uh, United Nations Charter. And uh, the International Court of Justice is definitely the court um, where the um, United Nations system to the highest level um, implement compliance with um, international uh, law. Um, and the issues of um, accountability of states, not persons, but states, are um, under the settling legal disputes. So states are in center here. Um, I will not spend more time because this is not a lecture on uh, International uh, Court of Justice. Um, and this is also not a law lecture, but I want to emphasize that within the system of uh, United Nations, um, International Court of Justice, uh, the member states engagement is from the coordination perspective, it's very limited. So the EU delegation doesn't intervene. And of course, the for understandable reasons, so independence of court um, would not allow um, also uh, political um, influencing from, from um, any of the parties. Um, with 15 judges that are elected under United Nations uh, General Assembly um, and, and uh, the Security Council from a list of persons that are uh, nationally proposed um, from groups on, under a permanent court of arbitration. Uh, so the again here the European Union would to lesser extent coordinate their actions um, when explained about the um, elected positions and coordination of the EU. Uh, here, it's it's not an issue. Some words about International Criminal Court in The Hague, and uh, this is quite a new court. A 20, 2002 was established under the Rome Statute, and uh, also um, located as uh, the International Court of Justice in The Hague. And in um, ICC, there uh, is the um, 
under Rome or uh, Rome statute, there is European uh, Union um, coordination on issues related administrative issues. So there can be um, um, a joint position on budget um, or joint position on procedures. But again, once we come to the uh, issues of uh, legal matters, so there is no political inferences uh, from uh, member states on uh, none of these bodies that are part of international um, criminal court structure. And finally, one court that is related to European Union law and the decision by um, the um, member states uh, within Foreign Affairs Council and is part of also budget from union, from CFSP budget, was the establishment of Kosovo special uh, chambers, uh, um, prosecutor's office in The Hague. And uh, this uh, court acts is also uh, quite a new body and acts with 15 international judges but is uh, financed by the EU budget of CFSB. So here we are not speaking about any kind of EU coordination, but rather that according to the objectives of the treaties uh, that the CFSB um, has um, focused its political will, but also resources in, um, in setting up uh, the court. So to summarize, and um, the objective of this lecture was to discuss the European Union role in international organizations. So the way how European Union acts within or with, with international organizations is reflected in the treaties and the treaties show the way both of bringing forward the objectives that the union presents, but also in a best way coordinating and in a best way um, ensuring that EU speaks with one voice when coordinating. In some cases, it is more successful. In some cases, it is less successful. But this is um, definitely responsibility both of EU delegations, responsibility of the presidencies, and engagement of all the EU member states to make this work successful. So I stop here and I wish you to also attend other online lectures. Thank you.